We'd all been drinking. It was a closing dinner, celebration of a deal well done. Dinner on the law firm meant free alcohol, and after months of 80-plus hour weeks, we all deserved to tie one on. It had been a long night with exuberant toasts, excessive food, even a belly dancer. As we spilled out onto the sidewalk in downtown D.C., two attorneys wearing wedding rings and a legal assistant I'd gone on a few dates with months earlier, all guys, asked if I wanted to share a taxi back to the trendy neighborhood where we all lived. I don't recall if I thought twice about this offer. In retrospect, I guess I should have. I should have reflected on previous behavior of the men involved. How one of the married attorneys made a practice of getting up from his desk after giving me an assignment so he could watch me walk away down the hall. A behavior I'd questioned after the first occurrence turning to ask, Is there something else? Receiving the answer, just enjoying the view. I should have remembered hands that lingered on my arm or back when discussing a project, hands that didn't belong on me in the first place. I should have considered the comments about the length of my legs or the fit of my skirt, the joke told when I'd slid under one of the large copiers to fix a paper jam, the countless innuendos and compliments I'd learn to respond to with a tight smile and a barely perceptible shake of my head. But as I slid into the back seat next to the legal assistant, followed by the view-admiring married attorney, his hand on my hip, providing assistance I hadn't asked for and didn't need, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was thinking about getting home. Doors closed and we pulled away from the curb. How many stops? The driver asked. The attorney in the front seat answered, four. Make that three, the legal assistant said, dropping his hand over my shoulder, fingertips resting on my breast in the age-old, exceedingly obvious groping maneuver guys thought women didn't see coming. He stage whispered in my ear, what do you think, before planting a sloppy kiss on my neck. No, thank you, I said. Four stops. I tried to lean forward as I spoke, but the legal assistant pulled me back. What's wrong? He slurred into my ear. You've kissed me before. That was different, and you know it, I said. She's kissed you? The married view admirer clearly found this encouraging. His hand slipped under my skirt onto my thigh. Definitely three stops. You can't turn us both down. Actually, I said, trying to keep my tone light, non-offensive, I can. Four stops. I swiped at the hands on my thigh and breast, pushed the face from my neck, adding, guys, cut it out. Collectively, they had four hands. I only had two. It wasn't a fair fight. Within a minute, the camaraderie of the closing dinner had faded, replaced by an oddly familiar panic that began to balloon in my chest. I looked toward the front seat, hoping one of the two men there would intervene. And suddenly, the memory of a feeling flooded over me, a memory of being trapped in the dark. I was 13 when I went on my first official date, homecoming, fall of my freshman year. I'd been standing by my locker a week before the big day when I received an awkward invitation from another freshman, Matt, about my height with brown hair. Matt was a guy you'd describe as average. Average height, average build, features you'd have trouble remembering for a police sketch artist, nothing notable. Initially, I demurred because Matt had never spoken to me before the homecoming invite, and this struck me as kind of odd. But then I talked to my girlfriends who reasoned I hadn't known anyone when I started high school just eight weeks earlier, and they were right. It was a parochial school in a Chicago suburb 30 minutes from where I lived. I hadn't known a soul. The girls encouraged me to say yes to Matt. He was cute, they said, quiet, the son of a local chief of police. He must be a good guy. So I said yes to Matt. And then we didn't speak again until two days before the dance when he asked for my address and told me his mom would drive us, pick me up, take us to the dance, drop us for dinner after. He asked if I liked Italian food. I said yes. That was it. Let's just say. 
when he showed up at my front door that Saturday evening, clutching a clear plastic corsage box, we did not know each other well. After the brief embarrassing corsage pinning and photo session, orchestrated by my mom, we went out to the driveway where his mom was waiting in the family station wagon. Matt and I sat on opposite sides of the back seat in total silence. Three minutes into the 30 minute ride, I thanked Matt's mom for driving and she and I started talking. She asked the usual, how did I like school? She'd heard I was a pom-pom girl, did I enjoy it? I did my best to follow my mother's rules for holding a conversation, namely, listen and engage with the other person. No monosyllabic responses for each question you answer. Ask one in return. This kept Matt's mom and me going for a while. She was polite, but the effort clearly tired her out. And Matt, it seemed he didn't want to be there. He looked out the window in complete, now totally uncomfortable silence. He's just shy and nervous, I told myself, what with his mom being in the front seat. It's bound to get better when we're at the dance. It didn't. We did not dance at the dance, nor did we talk. I tried at first asking about school, football, but Matt didn't adhere to any of my mom's conversation rules. It would be generous to say he uttered 10 words in two hours. We sat on the bleachers, staring out at the school gym decorated with crepe paper streamers and cardboard stars, watching other people have fun, waiting for it to end. Undeterred, I naively thought, maybe he's awkward because he thinks people are watching us. It'll get better when we're alone at the restaurant. It didn't. I ordered the chicken, as advised by my mother, because it's always the cheapest option and kept trying to engage with Matt. Have you read any books lately? No. Seen any movies? No. When I asked, what do you think of the fetal pig dissection? <laughs> I knew I'd gone too far. But the truth was, it's hard to hold a one-way conversation. Matt didn't ask me a single question. He didn't seem interested in getting to know me at all. No longer thinking it was going to get better, I began to look forward to going home, to having the whole thing over. And then we went outside, and his mom's station wagon wasn't there. Instead, there was a police car out front. A policeman got out, waved. It was Matt's dad, the chief of police. It turned out Matt's mom was having issues with her wagon, so she'd called his dad, who was there to bring me home in the police car. Matt and I got in the back seat behind a cage-like metal screen, and I immediately noticed there were no door handles or window cranks. I remember thinking, almost over. 30 more minutes of uncomfortable silence, and you'll be home. And for about 20 minutes, that's what it was. But then there, in the dark back seat, with no visible means of escape, Matt was suddenly very interested in getting to know me. He leaned across my body, aggressively kissing me, smashing my corsage. I pushed at his chest, whispering, no. This did not deter him. His hands were everywhere, under the neckline of my dress, pulling up the fabric of my skirt. I tried to push him away, to peel his hands from my body. And the whole time, his dad, the police chief, was watching through the cage in the rearview mirror, a strange kind of that's my boy, look on his face. When his dad finally released me from the back seat, I dashed up the driveway, calling back, you don't need to walk me to the door. Inside, I ran up the stairs. My mom called from the family room. How was it? Fine, I yelled, before escaping to my bedroom, where I ripped off the dress, climbed into bed, and pulled the covers over my head. I didn't speak to Matt ever again. It was a small school. I saw him nearly every day, not a word. But that wouldn't be an option with the men in the back of the taxi. I worked with them. I worked for one of them. The married attorney with his hand up my skirt had been my first interview at the firm. He'd advocated for me to get hired. 
Seriously, I said, slapping and pulling at this point, actually kind of shocked it was still going on. I looked up, half expecting to see the driver smirking in the mirror. And then the other attorney, the one in the front seat, turned to the driver saying, this is my street. It's one way, so you can drop me off here. Me too, I said. Let me out. I'll walk from here. Oh, come on. You don't have to get out, the legal assistant said, laughing. We're just kidding. The car stopped. The attorney in the front seat handed the driver a bill, exited, and taking a step toward the back door, opened it, saying, let her out. I lasted another six months at that job before quitting. But other than the men in the back of the taxi asking some form of, we're okay, right? And me deflecting with some form of, it's fine. We did not talk about what happened that night. Their behavior at work didn't change. The married attorney who liked my legs continued to enjoy the view when I walked away. Decades passed, and then not long ago, in one of those small world becoming smaller coincidences, the view admiring married attorney reconnected with me on Facebook. And I found myself wondering, would he remember any of this? Would Matt or his dad Remember that homecoming ride in the police car? And I realized, probably not. To them, it was just watching a young woman walk, a 13-year-old girl being kissed. It was just a grope, a joke, a feel, an innuendo. It wasn't fine. It was just the way things were the way things all too often still are.